If I told you to describe this NFL draft to me in one word, what would you choose? My word would be unpredictable. No one knows who's going to rise. No one knows who's going to fall. No one knows which player is going to go where. It's just so much possibilities that could happen. And this is especially a very unpredictable draft for the Baltimore Ravens because they are in unfamiliar territory with picking at the top half of the draft at pick 14 for now at least because the Ravens, they're going to have a lot of options. They could stay at pick 14. They have the ammo to move up if they want to. They also have the ability to trade back down if they choose. So the Ravens will have so many different options at their disposal. But to talk about some of those options, we had to bring in somebody who is one of the best at their job, especially when it comes to covering these Baltimore Ravens. And that is the Athletics' very own Jeff Zrebic. And with Jeff coming on the show, we are going to go through a plethora of different options that the Ravens have at so many different positions. But Team Keep It Clean, you also have plenty of options yourself. And you have plenty of options and varieties and flavors to choose from when it comes to your cobbler. Now, I know initially when you think cobbler, you think peach cobbler, right? Of course, we all do. But with Kentucky cobblers, they take it to a whole nother level. Let me tell you some of the draft picks that you could use when it comes to your cobbler. You could choose Amazing Apple, Bustin' Blueberry, Classic Cherry, Perfect Peach, Sweet Strawberry, Cookies and Cream, Strawberry Cheesecake, Cherry Cheesecake, Banana Cheesecake, Blueberry Cheesecake, White Chocolate Cobbler. And there's plenty more. So when you go to KentuckyCobblers.com or you follow them on Instagram at Kentucky Cobblers, you will have so many options to choose from. But like I said before, if you ain't believe me, Buy them all. Just get all of them because it's too many to choose from. Matt Elam ain't the only one that says eat greedy. Yeah, this feels like a dream. And you know just what I mean. You see my boy, he like got to made it. How to made it. Boy, he's a fan and he like the Ravens. Like the Ravens. And you know just what I mean. You two team keep it clean. You see my boy, he like got to made it. How to made it. Team Keep It Clean, a uh, very special <laughs> guest that we have on the show uh, today. It is uh, your favorite notification that we all get. If you follow him on Twitter, which I'm sure that you already do, uh, it's Jeff Dreaming. So I, I appreciate you. We appreciate you uh, coming on this morning to just go over everything that's happening uh, with the Ravens and what they plan on doing for the draft. Um, and just to talk about some different holes that they have and just to really cover the Ravens, period. But first, um, I wanted to ask you, how, how did you get started? How did, how did you end up getting into this position to cover the Ravens? What, what made you want to do it? How did you do it? Just how did that come about? Yeah, you know, you know, when I was in high school, I, I you know, I, I, I always wanted to be a sports announcer, but you kind of realize mm -hmm. that, you know, most of those jobs are going to former players and, you mm -hmm. know, it just didn't feel very attainable. You, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. uh, I got heavily involved in my high school newspaper and the year, um, you know, one of the years where I was at school, the, uh, my high school um, won the state championship. And at the time, and this shows how old I am, the, the um, final, you know, the state finals was at the Meadowlands, old giant stadium. And, you know, I was covering it, you know, but covering it, I'm working for a high school newspaper, you know, but still uh, I was allowed to go up in the press box at giant stadium. And, and, you know, we're still talking about a high school game. So it's not like it was packed with, with reporters, but there were still some reporters up there from different papers. And it was just a thrill for me to see how they were working and just to be in a, a NFL press box um, you know, of the team, you know, I'm, I'm from New Jersey, you know, I, right. I grew up as a giant fan. So it was, that was just a thrill for me. And that kind of just kind of added to the thirst. And then, you know, at every level or, you know, in, in college, I worked in the school newspaper and was the editor of my paper at Loyola and got an internship at the Baltimore sun. And, and, and it kind of just went from there. You know, I, you know, one of the things I, I love so much about the time at the Sun is I got a chance to cover pretty much everything. You know, I, I, yeah. I did everything from, you know, local college basketball, the University of Maryland basketball, the high schools to college lacrosse, which we know how big is in this area. Then I went on the Orioles beat for a while and then I went on the Ravens beat. Um, and, you know, my first year was the uh, ill-fated Billy Cundiff year, you know, in, in 2011. <laughs> um, but I kind of joined mid-season. Uh, Jameson had gone uh, to ESPN 
and they right. needed a beat writer. And I'd been on the Orioles for a long time and I was kind of looking to do something different. So, mm. you know, I, the Ravens are the biggest show in town. And yeah. um, so I, I told my editor I'd be interested if they're looking for somebody. And, and that just sort of, had it, sort of how it came about in the middle of the 2011 season. So uh, I like to tell people that my first full year was the Super Bowl year in 2012, mm. which is uh, which is true and, and was incredibly enjoyable considering I covered oh, yeah. some really bad uh, Orioles teams during my time <laughs> on that beat. That's what's up, man. I, I remember um, – I don't remember what year it was, but I, I remember when uh, you you sort of made this big announcement that you were leaving the Baltimore Sun. And I know a lot of us who followed you, we started freaking out a bit like, oh man, <laughs> Jeff, he's not gonna cover the Ravens anymore. But then you were like, oh, but I'm going to the Athletic. I was like, oh, okay, yeah. cool, man. Cause that had us worried a little bit. Yeah, because yeah. I, I regret how I handled that. And, and <laughs> Anthony Levine still gives me crap about that. Oh, really? uh, he's, yeah, he always kind of uh, acted like I was grandstanding a little bit and, and all in good fun. Anthony Levine yeah. likes to tweak a lot of people, but yeah, you know, we couldn't announce it to the athletic yet. Mm -hmm. You know, we had a set date where we had to wait. And I was kind of going off the grid and I was worried that people were going to be like, well, first of all, you know, I got Twitter questions. I was, you know, I, I felt disingenuous answering them and not saying, well, I'm actually not on the beat right now, the Baltimore Sun. And, right. um, you, you know, like I was worried that people were going to see other people at the Sun writing Raven stuff and be like, where's Jeff? And, question was going to be out there but yeah i probably should have just not said anything or said i will be covering the ravens just at a different outlet but i thought that was pretty much i didn't know how my athletic bosses would think about that because uh you, you know i think it would have been pretty obvious at the time because athletic was hiring a lot of people mm. yeah it's all good it worked out man <laughs> now with with being a reporter covering the ravens um how does that process work like when it's breaking news what does Jeff Zrebig have to go through? Yeah, I mean, um, you know. Now, I know you can't say everything. Yeah, yeah, I no, I got gotcha. you. Right. If you're the one breaking it, you know, that's always good. But we know it's very competitive. And, you mm -hmm. know, the national national reporters on NFL are kind of break a lot of the news, which is kind of frustrating. But, you know, I, I tip my cap to them. They work really hard, too. So it's mm -hmm. nothing against them. Um, but, yeah, it, it's, you know immediately if you hear something or if you hear there's news or news coming on, I, I usually alert my editor directly. And then I try to get enough confirmation to go with the news. And and I'm not talking about uh, confirmation from, you know, second or third parties, you, you know, like when it's news, you, you need to get it directly from somebody involved in the decision or the right. move, or it's hard to trust. You know, I hear a lot of stuff. Like people always ask me, what are you hearing? <laughs> All reporters hear a lot of stuff. The, the, the challenge of this job is getting it from good enough sources where you trust enough to go with it. And, and, and that's trying to confirm it with people involved in the decision and whether that's agents or GM or. Uh oh, thank you. Know, oh, players, a, a lot of players directly are, are willing to talk, um, you know, at times behind kind of back channels. So it's just it's just trying to figure out the information, confirm the information with appropriate people. Mm -hmm. um, there's plenty of times where I hear something and I think it's happening, but I can't get it from a good enough source to say, look, here's my editor. My editor's name is Ken Bradley. Here, Ken, I'm hearing this from so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so that this is happening. Can we go with this? And I don't take him, you know, I can't go, I can't say to him, you know, I'm hearing this from a, a friend of a player or a guy who says he ran into somebody at a club <laughs> or you know how it is. So that, that's the biggest challenge. The Ravens are a very buttoned up organization. Um, they don't play the media game very often. I mean, they treat us respectfully. I don't want that to be misconstrued here. But they're not big on leaking stuff unless it's probably going to benefit the Ravens, you mm -hmm. know, it, especially during the draft time. It's a highly competitive time for them. Uh, yeah. uh, and, uh, you know, they're pretty tight lipped. It comes a lot of stuff. And as a reporter, you know, I hate doing this. But sometimes you just got to admit, I don't know. I think saying yeah. I don't know and I haven't been able to confirm something is a whole heck of a lot better than saying something and reporting something wrong that you're right. hearing based on hearsay or from sources not directly involved. Mm -hmm. That's true. Uh, something that you brought up just now, 
Uh, you talked about trust, uh, having trust in your sources uh, and even being willing to admit if there's something that you don't know, because there's a certain level of trust that a lot of people have for you. Um, but that reminds me of big trust. And that is Lamar <laughs> Jackson. And recently there's been a whole lot of conversation uh, about Lamar Jackson, but apparently there's not a whole lot of conversation with Lamar Jackson. As of right now, um, what's going on with the contract talks or really the lack thereof uh, with Lamar? And, and how do you see this, this playing out in the long run? Yeah, um, and, and that's a perfect segue because – you know, that's the perfect example. I'm hearing a ton about the Lamar Jackson situation. <laughs> yeah. I'm just not hearing a ton from people who are heavily involved in it. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So I could speculate uh, to my heart's content, and it's just mm -hmm. not the right way to play it. He has such a small inner circle of people um, that know stuff. And obviously, DeCosta and company are keeping this so quiet because, you know, it's, you know, right. first of all, they're negotiating directly with him. Second of all, I, I mean, this is they do not want to jeopardize the relationship with their franchise mm -hmm. quarterback. So they're going to be very careful in what they say and what's out there. You know, it's not just negotiating. He, you know, they're you know, they're, they have a relationship to worry about with the right. quarterback. So, um, you know, I, not everything that's out, you know, like that the Ravens have said, it, you know, they're ready to go. They've been wanting to engage. Um, and Lamar Jackson just has not shown a whole lot of interest in the process now and, and, and not disrespectfully, it's just, he's not, he's not been ready to, um, you know, kind of engage in, in back and forth conversation. I, I don't believe he was in the building last week for the start of off season workout program, which the, you know, that's fine. It's voluntary right. and he's, you know, there's plenty of video evidence of him working on his game. I, the Ravens, you know, some teams worry a whole lot about attendance at these voluntary the Ravens worry about the players that are there. It's not to say they didn't wish everybody was there. I think every right. every coach would, but that's just not reality. And they sort of have a culture where, look, a lot of the vets stay away until they have to be there. That, that's that been the case for a while, and, and mm -hmm. they don't spend a whole lot of time getting worried about it. So, uh, I, you know, here we are Monday. It's a little bit early in the morning. I haven't heard anything. I know they start another off-season week of workouts uh, this week. So who knows? Um, but I, I don't – you know, I don't get this. I, I don't get the sense that things are not on good terms. I just think this is how Lamar is choosing to approach it. Um, it's interesting. It's certainly an interesting path. What we don't know and what I don't speculate it on is how much is his. I mean, they Eric DeCosta said at one point they talked. I think it was four or five times about his contract within a year. Mm -hmm. So. I think we'd all be naive. I, I, I don't want to connect too many dots, but I think we could safely connect the dots that money, you're talking to somebody so much about his contract, money had to be discussed during this. I, you just don't talk to someone that much and not exchange ideas and figures. Right. The question is, is his stance of not wanting to talk because he didn't like the initial stuff he was hearing and he just says, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm just going to play this out. Or is it just the way he wants, as, you know, Clay Campbell said on a radio show and Steve Bishotti said recently, you know, they, they brought up the, he wants to win a Super Bowl and then engage, or he wants to have a little more success and then engage. I don't know if that's the case. And I also don't know. I mean, but there had to be talk about numbers at some point. And if the Ravens and him were in the same kind of area code on, on the talks, would they hammer out a deal? Would he be interested in, in, in those circumstances. And, and that I cannot answer. I wish I could uh, just because we're not hearing anything from his side about how these negotiations have gone down. I mean, it's interesting. He's going to be the quarterback this year. Um, and he's still in line to be the quarterback the following year because there's franchise tags. So there's time, uh, but you certainly thought that it would be done by now. Right. And it is a really, really tricky situation. And I know just hearing a lot of the media talk about it, they they bring up that this is something that's just it's it's unlike anything that's ever happened before. Because you of yeah. course have plenty of players that don't have contracts. You have players mm -hmm. that negotiate big deals. I mean, that not that don't have contracts, but don't that don't have agents. Uh, and you have players that negotiate big deals that don't have agents, but to have a quarterback that could really just destroyed a market in a good way uh for his yeah. sake um and he doesn't have an agent that's big that's that's yeah. really big um so I, shout yeah. out to Le shout out to lamar for just doing it his way um yeah i, I mean go ahead. go ahead 
Yeah, I, I, the guy is such a unique personality, and I say that in a good way. I don't think he's worried a whole heck of a lot about what other people are telling him. He's done it his way the whole time coming up, mm -hmm. and his way got him a Heisman Trophy at Louisville, made him a first-round draft pick in the NFL, and made him just a second unanimous MVP in NFL history. Now, okay, you can question it all you want, and, you know, obviously he's had – plenty of help along the way. His mom's done a terrific job uh, with him. He, he's a, a polite, you know, guy and, and right. you know, everyone loves to be around him. There's so many good things you could say there. So who am I to criticize his approach? You, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you know, it is unique. It, it is in a sense, making things difficult for the Ravens in terms of these negotiations, but that's his choice. This is his career we're talking about. And if that's the way he wants to approach things, I, I think you have to respect it. Yeah, I feel you. Um, and somebody else that Lamar has a lot of respect for and a lot of love for uh, is Hollywood Brown. Yeah. Now, Hollywood Brown, of course, he's going into his fourth year uh, with the Ravens, 2019 first round draft pick. And probably, um, oh, obviously, the biggest impact from that 2019 uh, draft class. Um, but now Eric DaCosta about a month and change ago, he said, Hey, we are going to pick up Hollywood Brown's fifth year option. Yeah. Well, we expect to pick it up. Um, but I told people like, all right, words are one thing, but actions yeah. are another. And we haven't heard anything official yet with the fifth year option. Now I know a lot of times Ravens, um, with things like this, they can announce, they wait to announce them like at the last minute. They mm -hmm. usually do it with the, um, when, when this roster time, when they are doing a 53 man roster, all that stuff usually gets announced like three fifty nine yeah. <laughs> with 59 seconds left. Absolutely. On the um, yeah. They always wait to the last second. So what do you know the status of Hollywood right now with the fifth year optional? Yeah. Uh, I haven't heard anything's changed there. I, you know, my understanding is that's still the plan and, you said it great. They are a deadline team. They work right up to the deadline. They mm -hmm. view it as if they view it as a formality. And and I could be wrong. I would have to go back and Google this, but I forgot when the official announcement came on exercising Lamar Jackson came, even though that was the worst kept secret. I mean, there was there's no hiding <laughs> that. They were gonna do that. Um, so uh that's the thing. Um I, I I just think it's kind of a formality and we get close mm. to the deadline and I think it's coming up here. I think, is it next week? Early May. Yeah. Yeah. Early I think May. it's next week. Uh, I would expect to hear that they, they did it, that, that they exercise it. I mean, and you look at the contracts of what wide receivers are getting. Mm -hmm. Does Lamar, does Marquise Brown at 13 million next year sound that bad to you? I, I, I mean, I, I think there's like 21 receivers making more than that right now, I, mm. it, just in terms of APY. So um, and Eric DaCosta predicted exactly that. He said, we don't think that's a, a you know, a, a number that is out of the realm, you know, like we think that that's fine. So I expect them to pick it up. Um, you know, and it's it just been interesting. And we talked a little about it earlier. I'm real careful not to speculate on stuff you see or don't see on social media, right? I think that gets yeah. you in trouble. I mean, how many times <laughs> has a player said something and people jump to conclusions what he means and it means nothing or some, you know, somebody reports something and it just, you know, it, mm -hmm. it, it's not true and it kind of takes you down a, a trail that that is just gets so far from the truth. <laughs> um, but it has been interesting. You know, we've all seen the workout videos with Lamar Jackson, James Prochet, mm -hmm. and Rashad Bateman. Uh, you know, Marquise Brown and Lamar Jackson are best friends. You, you kind of wonder, well, why is Marquise Brown there or whatever? And he sort of had a, a multimedia shutdown, I guess. Uh, I'm not on Instagram, uh, and I know I should be, but I'm just not. Um, but um, he hasn't really said much about Twitter until last week. He had some workout photos up there. And he, uh -huh. he also was not at the facility last week for the voluntary, which is fine. Uh, that guy's one of their hardest working guys on the team. You, you, don't, worry, you don't worry about him at all. Uh, but it'll be interesting to have him back in the building. I, I can't possibly think that he expects to have his contract addressed before the quarterbacks. You, you know what I mean? So I think all systems are uh, are go there with Marquise Brown. And, and uh, unless I hear otherwise, 
you know, we'll see him later this summer. And I think he's going to have a big year. I, you know, I know he's pretty polarizing player among the fan base. And uh, oh, I think, yeah. I think, we, I think a lot of us are guilty and me included at times of concentrating so much on what a player doesn't do maybe rather than focusing on what the player does do well. And Marquise Brown does an awful lot well for this team is important piece of the offense. Oh yeah, for sure. And another very, very important piece for the offense. And he would literally change so much about this offense. If he's healthy, that would be Ronnie Stanley. Um, yeah. Ronnie Stanley is, he's big for this team moving forward. And he reminds me sort of like an offensive version of Jimmy Smith, because yeah, when call. they're on the, f so you got to take a call. No, I said, that's a good call. Oh, oh my yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause with Jimmy Smith, when he was on the field for the Ravens throughout the years, he did his thing. Phenomenal player made a huge difference. But when he went out every time without fail, the Ravens, they would end up going out. Um, but then recently over these past couple of years, they, they loaded up with more cornerbacks, especially around the time when they got Brandon Carr. Uh, but with Ronnie Stanley, it, it's been the same thing. With Ronnie Stanley's in, the offense moves a lot better. Of course, the protection is a lot better. But when Ronnie Stanley goes out, it, it is such a huge blow. Um, so with Ronnie Stanley, uh, I know a lot of questions will really be answered come draft time um, because that'll, depending on how early or late they take a tackle and offensive lineman that'll really that may tell us where they how they feel about Ronnie Stanley moving forward, how they feel about the status of him, his return. But what what's the status of Ronnie Stanley right now? Is it still just a kind of a wait and see type of thing? Or? Yeah, yeah, and and I think um, and DeCosta's already admitted that they were much too optimistic last off season about his mm. status and probably painted too much of a rosy picture. So the last thing I expected was them to come out and say, oh, yeah, he'll be ready for week one again. I mm. think they're going to be cautious in everything that they say about him. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, it wasn't just him last year. I think there are, you know, a lot of people, Nick Boyle, and there's other people that, oh, yeah. you know, they, they spoke very positively about. And then when fans didn't see them on the field, fans in the media didn't see him on the field for training camp. And then week one, it was just like, well, were, were they lying or, you know, so I think they're going to be very cautious about any the injury updates on all those guys Dobbins Gus included mm, uh yeah. but they're they've gotten good reports on Ronnie Stanley you, you, you know what I mean and and um I think they're optimistic I, I thought it was interesting that Steve Bishotti um you know when he spoke to a small group of us in Florida uh, I guess it was about a month ago he didn't even mention left tackle as a need and you know, you may say, well, you know, he's probably just playing that game and they don't want them to, you know, they don't want other teams to think they're in on a left tackle or in the draft. But Bishotti's not a big game player through the media. He's going to give it to you, shoot straight, or at least he has that reputation. So uh, I've never, uh, in the years I've spent and the times I've talked to him, I've never, you know, encountered him really using the media uh, uh, to, to play certain games. So um, I, their plan is to have Ronnie Stanley on the field However, I think we all saw last year, um, you need a better contingency plan. And mm -hmm. they're not going to be caught in that same position. I, the Ravens uh, are a smart organization. It's kind of a fool me once kind of thing. They're not going to be caught again not having a better contingency plan. Um, look, if they, go, if they go step up to the podium at pick 14 and the pick is either Charles Cross or Trevor Penning, then I think everyone's going to say, wow, that's a really telling, um, you know, to Ronnie Stanley status, right? You know, they wouldn't be taking, uh, excuse me, they wouldn't be picking a tackle after signing Moses and bringing back Juwan James unless they knew yeah. Stan Ronnie Stanley's uh, status was, wasn't great. Outlook wasn't great. But I don't know that I'm going to be ready to say that. I think, yeah, sure, it will reflect the uncertainty about Ronnie Stanley's situation. Uh, but I think if they pick a tackle – it goes to show you, A, they just feel they do not want to get caught in the situation that was last year, you know, you know, where they got caught without a, a suitable right. replacement for them, and that helped sink their season. So, um, and, and B, you know, young ta bookend tackles don't grow on trees, and they don't want to be drafting at 14 too often. So <laughs> if, if they grab one, it also would have something to do with it. Look, it's a rare opportunity to, to get a guy they really like at a premium position. Uh, but, yeah, so far so good on Stanley, but it's a ways to go, I think. I, don't, I wouldn't expect right. him to be on the field early in training camp. Uh, but at, at last I heard, it, 
there hasn't been any negative so far uh, throughout the process. Uh, things are going in the right direction, I should say. Mm. And speaking of going in the right direction, we are a couple of days away from the draft and the Ravens have so many right directions that they could go in when it comes to pick the overall 14 and, and really so on and so forth throughout the draft. They're going to have a lot of options because this is a uh, unfamiliar territory for them. Just really being able to pick this high uh, yeah. is just something that doesn't happen too often. Um, so at pick 14, what do you feel like right now uh, the Ravens biggest need is? for the team. Yeah. I, I mean, I think you could make a case for two different things. And I know some will make a case for tackle. I'm not there yet as that, that being their biggest need, even if there is concern about Stanley. I mean, uh, I think you have some guys there. I mean, I know Juwan James hasn't played much tackle and it's sort of an injury or much left tackle and it's an injury risk. Uh, but you, if he's the left tackle and he's healthy and you start him there the first day of training camp, I think he'd be absolutely fine, but obviously that's an if I get it. I'm just saying, I look at the edge rush and I look at the cornerback picture and to me, those kind of dwarf the other, the other potential needs. Um, I just, you know, uh, there's a lot of optimism about Tyus Bowser. I can't yeah. tell you what a good athlete that guy is. I hope people appreciate it. Like he's a freak, that guy athletically. And uh, you know, I hear confidence. He's going to be, but we're talking about a torn Achilles in mid-January. Didn't have the surgery either till late January or early February. I, I mean, that's a lot to ask to think he's going to be the Tyus Bowers or they know and love by week one. Mm -hmm. um, and Owe, I think, will be fine. But, uh, you know, from shoulder surgery, I think Owe is going to have a big year. But that that's kind of one guy, you know, like – Jalen yeah. Ferguson, okay. Uh, I think they like him as an edge setter, but, you know, it's really – the pass rush hasn't really come. Um, and Dalen Hayes, you know, what did he play? Five snaps last year. So I just think they really need an edge rusher. And I think every NFL team, especially one with Super Bowl aspirations, needs to go into it thinking they need four or five starting caliber corners just because of the attrition at the position – and right now, I think the Ravens have two. Um, yeah. I don't want to dismiss Brandon Stevens from playing in the nickel. I think that's something I have done. And, you know, Marcus Williams' addition frees him up a little. So, you know, him and our Darius Washington even probably are now in the cornerback mix. And, and that's mm -hmm. good. That gives them some depth. And and Kayvon Seymour is a guy they like a little bit, you, you know. But um, still, I think they need two more corners that are capable of stepping in and starting if so. And, and um, you know, I, I almost think it's imperative that they come out of day one or day two with a corner. Um, and then there's still some veterans in the free agent market uh, right. I would look at, but all in all, I would double dip at both spots. I just think they're two important edge rusher and, and corner. You have 10 picks, who knows how many picks you finish with, but those are two spots where, especially in this draft filled with edge rush, I'd like to, I'd like to come out of this draft with two of them. How how do you feel? Because somebody that I've had my eye on, especially for the Ravens, because the Ravens up front, you talked about the edge rushes, which is a need as well. But up front on defense, interior pass rush has been an issue uh, for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, now, the scheme, of course, is going to be changing going from Wink to uh, Mike McDonald. And I'm sure Mike yeah. McDonald, he's going to have some things that Wink does that he implements, but he's going to do a lot of his own thing uh, as well. Um, but Jordan Davis, that's a guy who um, I really like for the Ravens because I feel like he would bring more pressure on the interior than a Brandon Williams um, and maybe a little less than Lodi Nada, but I feel like he would be such a significant problem up front and he could make everybody else's job around him that much easier just from his presence alone. He would help the edge guys from bringing interior pressure. He would help the corners because they wouldn't have to be on an island as long. And obviously that helps the safeties as well. So how do you feel about Jordan Davis from Georgia? I think he's the most fascinating player in the draft. I really do because if you believe in him and you believe in that three down potential, I think you run up that card. Um, and, you know, like... I've tried to get differing opinions. I've tried to talk to some people outside the organization. 
Mm-hmm. And yeah, you know, on him, just because I think he will absolutely be part of the conversation. Sorry, man. Um, I, you know, I'm not saying they will draft him, but I, I think if he's there, he, he – a lot of time while they're on the clock, that 10 minutes in the first round will be spent <laughs> discussing Jordan Davis. But, you know, and they'll already have those discussions. But, um, yeah, here's the thing. I, I think every great Ravens defense, right, has had that big stud in the middle of it. You know, that guy that demands attention and, and you know, can absorb double teams and is explosive. I, I mean, all their great defenses, you, you know, they need that guy. Um, you know, is it, you know, because you didn't see a ton of tackle for losses or sacks, I think it's fair t- to question, you know, you kind of have to project a little bit on Jordan Davis, but you, you got to project on a lot of these guys. You, you know what I mean? That's the name of the game. Um, so it, it, it he's – you know, I say fascinating player. I also meant fascinating decision on him. Mm-hmm. You know, Daniel Jeremiah, who knows more about how the Ravens do business than any of these draft pundits out there, you know, basically said the other day that he thinks he's the pick. If he's there, he doesn't think the Ravens will be able to resist him. You know, knowing how much they value big guys in the middle of the interior, knowing their current needs, knowing the fact that they love SEC players. Um, you know, so I, 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 I think you, I think if you're a Raven fan and he's the pick Friday night, you can go to bed sleeping. Well, I think that would be a big piece they could get, uh, in the, um, you you know, in, in their whole defensive transformation, but a lot of it's going to be, you know, up to Jordan, how they develop them. Like, you know, I talked to somebody who was a little concerned about, you know, obviously there's some questions about his playing weight. Uh, you know, there are times last year where he was probably a little too big, um, and wasn't a, as explosive and quick and had to come out a lot. There are times he'd go hard for a couple snaps and go on sideline for a couple. Um, I, I think those are that's where you trust your people. You know, you trust your coaches. You do the due diligence. Look, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Mike McDonald was at Georgia for, for a while. Like he's got sources at University of Georgia. You know, Mike McDonald started there, knows a lot of people there. Um, obviously, you know, he was in the college landscape last year. So they'll have good information on Jordan Davis. And and if they pick him, uh, I trust they fully believe in his ability to be a three down guy and just to be, you know, be able to move around and do different things. But I don't think Jordan Davis is for everybody. Uh, but mm-hmm. I think right. he is definitely a guy that the Ravens, you know, would consider a good fit. And something else, speaking of good fits, um, the Ravens a couple of years ago, first round pick Patrick Queen. Um, yeah. And he's sort of been up and down. Uh, and they, they brought back Josh Bynes again. But before they brought back Josh Bynes, they tried to sign a Bobby Wagner. Um, and the report was that they even offered him 18 mil fully guaranteed. So he could have gotten more guaranteed money from the Ravens than he got from the Rams because the Rams was with all the incentives and whatnot. Um, So that let me know that they are not 100% sold on Patrick Queen, um, especially with them bringing back Josh Bynes too. So do you feel like a a sneaky pick, not even necessarily at in the first round, but a, a sneaky pick for the Ravens, of course, Chris Board, he went to the Lions uh, LJ Ford's a free agent. I believe Christian Welch is still on the roster. Okay. Um, you still have Malik Harrison, too. They said that they may try him at inside and outside linebacker, so we'll see what happens with that. Um, but I feel like a, a sneaky pick for the Ravens uh, could be at linebacker. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm not a mock draft guy. Uh, I have to do a couple, and, and my second one will come out. Um, later this week but i found in both times doing a mock the hardest thing i could do was project an inside linebacker to him i mean there was like a every round there's a guy I considered i just had a hard time finding finding a great fit mm. um i think they need to come out of this draft with a p i mean look they don't even have enough depth right now at that position uh mm. t- to go into a season I, I mean especially if if malik harrison's cross training that outside mm. linebacker and, and they seem serious about it because when – and I know it's a different defensive coordinator. All right. Mike, Mike will have his own ideas. But last year after he came back from the, uh, you know, the unfortunate, you know, mm-hmm. the gun, gunshot incident in his calf, 
he was almost practicing exclusively at outside linebacker, hmm. um, you, you know, and, and so that told me a lot, you know, it's so you, you right. So right now you, you, you have Bynes, you have Patrick Queen um, and Christian Welch gave them some okay snaps, but I think, you know, if he's playing a lot, there would have been an issue in front of him. Mm-hmm. I think he's there for, you know, core special teamer uh, first and foremost. So, um, I, I think they need to find a guy in one of those rounds. Now, I don't necessarily – I would be surprised if Lloyd's the guy at 14. Um, you know, maybe if they trade back, Lloyd could be the guy. Um, just haven't heard that buzz on him relate to the Ravens as I have on some other first-round picks, potential mm-hmm. first-round picks, excuse me. Uh, but I, I think they need to find a guy. I just had a hard time finding a, a, a great fit. And I also will say this, not dismissing the need. I think I was, you know, I said pretty clearly that, that they, there's a need there. But Marcus Williams opens up the ability to do a lot of things with that inside linebacker. Like, like I'm just thinking about it. We'll see what Mike McDonald has to say. But how many times do they figure to have two inside linebackers on the field, right? I, I mean, you have Tony Jefferson who could become play close to the line of scrimmage. Yeah. I think you have other guys you could use uh, Gino Stone, you know, Gino Stone's a guy that came on last year. You drop him and Mar- Marcus Williams back and bring Ch- uh, Chuck Clark close to the line of scrimmage. So oh, yeah. I think they have options there. I don't think they're going to have two linebackers on the field a ton. Mm-hmm. So I think there is some some flexibility there where they don't feel like they, they have to chase a need. But, mm-hmm. the, the, you know, the Ravens have always have had good inside linebackers. They, they need they need another guy. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a really good point. Um, but like you mentioned earlier, uh, as far as the secondary, um, they lost a lot uh, in the secondary this off season. Um, Jimmy Smith, he's still out there. Um, I I really thought that he was going to retire. Um, I was I have been surprised that we haven't heard like an announcement with that or anything like that. Um, of course, Anthony Averett, he went to the Raiders. Uh, they released Tavon Young. He signed with the Bears. Um, so a lot of the, the depth that they had is, is gone. Um, so at 14 and of course, throughout the, the, the remainder of the draft, um, they're definitely, uh, they, they have to come away with some depth, um, in the secondary, uh, somebody that I really like if, if it's going to be at 14, uh, is McDuffie, uh, is Trent McDuffie to me, he reminds me like of a, uh, he reminds me of Marcus Peters. Uh, especially when he has the ball in his hand, because he sort of carries it out just like Marcus <laughs> Peters in, in his run style. It just it just reminds me so much of Marcus Peters. Um, so if they were to get him, I, I wouldn't be mad at that. Uh, but what what cornerbacks have you been looking at? Yeah, uh, I you know throughout the process, as you hear more and watch guys closer, mm-hmm. I don't think anyone has made as as gradual impression on me than McDuffie I, I in the beginning I was you know I, I guess unfairly I sort of dismissed him just because he's not the pro I mean we we know how many times have you heard it the Ravens love long corners yeah, awesome. mm-hmm. and, and that's not McDuffie but um and I you know I give him you know I, I don't want to say dismissed it too early but just was kind of like uh eh, you know I think they'd be okay with him but the, I can't see them taking a guy like that 14. Now I would absolutely not be surprised if he's the pick at 14. Um, in fact, and, and we talked about, you know, both these positions already. I, I think who knows how this draft's going to play out, first of all. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think it's very realistic to be on the clock at 14, and the three guys they're going to have to make a legitimate choice on are going to be uh, Jordan Davis, Trent McDuffie, and, and Penning, the uh, tackle from Northern Iowa. Um, and, and we'll see, like, again, a lot, there could be other guys in there, but those three guys, I think if they're there will factor in their decision-making, not saying they're going to pick them, but they'll factor, but I, I've really grown to like Duffy. Uh, I just think, I know you don't want to go about this as, okay, well, who's the safe pick, but I think when you talk about floor, McDuffie's floor is high, you know, I think at worst, you're going to have a very good corner for, for, you know, with the rookie option for his five years. And that's mm-hmm. an important piece. You know, I think he's ready to play right away. And that's another important piece. And I think there's so much to like about him um, where maybe you don't overlook the fact that he's not ideal size, but he checks every other box. And 
I mean, off the charts on intangibles. I mean, we know a Ravens red star guy is a guy that checks all the scouts stand up on the table for. I'd be surprised if he's not on their list of red star guys. And that means a lot. Uh, he's scheme versatile. He can do different things. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's a, both a, a willing and an enthusiastic run stopper. Like, he mm-hmm. has no problem sticking his nose in there. Uh, I mean, it's really grown on me. Uh, again, I, you know, I think who knows what happens in front of them. But if you're asking me who's the guy, and, and I've been asked that plenty of times, I guess it depends on who's available. But right. he would die on my list to get him out. I just think uh, they need they need cornerback help. Um, and you get a guy like that, you feel great about your top three corners again. And mm-hmm. then at depth in other rounds. But um, yeah, I, I really like him. Um, and, uh, you know, I suspect they do too, even though that he doesn't necessarily match their prototype, uh, for a first round corner. Yeah. Um, you spoke about feeling good about your top three corners and yeah, that, that would be something that would completely change just the, the landscape of the Ravens. Cause I know right now they, they can't feel that way. They can't be comfortable with their top three no. corners. No. Um, because those top three corners, they have to go against top three receivers on other teams. Uh, you have the Bengals, Jamar Chase, uh, Tyler Boyd, T. Higgins. Uh, you had the Steelers with Chase Claypool, Deontay uh, Thompson, um, and hey, now Miles Boykin. Yeah. Um, and, and we'll see uh, with the Browns, Amari Cooper. Um, could still resign uh, Landry. They could. The, the, yeah. the other one is slipping my mind. I can't think of his name right now off the top of my head. But and I, I still think they're, they're not done at receiver either. Uh, and yeah. yeah, you mentioned they could bring back Jarvis Landry, but as yeah, far as I the mean, Raiders, pe- oh, go ahead. Yeah, Peoples Jones too. Uh, That's Peoples the one. Jones had good some of. good games for him. And uh, I agree with you. And I think the Browns and Steelers are both going to pick a receiver early. And that Bengals group is scary. Uh, you just can't match up if you don't have three or four corners that you like. Mm-hmm. And, and speaking of matchups. But uh, switching it, switching gears to Ravens offense now. There's been a lot of talk, especially on here, about receiver, about the receivers. Of course, you got Rashad Bateman um, going into his second year, uh, and hopefully he'll be fully healthy this year. You got Hollywood going into his fourth year, um, and hopefully he can continue on the trend that he was continuing on. Like he he started off even with the drops and whatnot, he was on a really good trend to have a good season. Um, then of course. Lamar went out and Hollywood's numbers dipped. Um, But that was sort of expected because the chemistry with Tyler Huntley wasn't there and with Josh Johnson, it wasn't there. Not nearly as as much as it is with Lamar. Um, But then you have Devin DuVernay. You have James Prochet. um, You have Tylen Wallace going into his second year. Um, How are you feeling about these Ravens wide receivers? Because the way that I feel, I, I think that they should take a wide receiver early again. Well, even if it's not the first round, if it's the, the, the second round at the latest, I think that they should take a receiver again. I know they have other needs on the team and whatnot, but I just feel like this Ravens team could really use another receiver to really take them over the top, um, to really just maximize Lamar Jackson, maximize, and it would help make everybody else's job that much easier. But how do you feel about the Ravens receiver room right now? I, I, I like the receiver room, but uh, there's a lot of questions there. And, and, and unfortunately, it's just it seems like, uh, you know, there's just no consistency mm. on how the guys get used and, mm-hmm. and how we see them. I mean, we saw a couple games last year where you'd think James Prochet is the answer as that number three <laughs> receiver. And then he's a healthy scratch, mm-hmm. you, you know, and Tylen Wallace was mostly used as a gunner. He had a couple catches late in the year week. You think, mm-hmm. oh, OK. And I mean. It was interesting to see Steve Vishotti brought up Tylen Wallace twice uh, without prodding as a guy he expects to kind of break out. Um, you know, Duvernay, I think, is a guy we owe, all of us think they should use him more. You know, so my concern is this, and, and I'm not anti receiver because there's so many good ones, but let's face it, there's going to be so many good – with how college football is going, there's going to be so many good receivers in every draft. I mean, when's the last time there hasn't been a good receiver draft? It's been a, it's been a, a while. There's just – those guys are just everywhere. Um, and I, I think, you know, I, I just think when you have that many draft picks uh, and, and, you know, that good receiver class, okay, I could just see Eric wanting to take a shot at another one. 
Um, but the I just I mean I don't know. First of all, every receiver they have is in their rookie contract, right? Is that right. a problem? I don't know. I I mean I I think it would be nice to get a a kind of a big bodied veteran to come and come in as a number three or four, or just as a guy who's not going to set the world on fire, but you can rely on and just diversifies the receiver group a little, uh, gives a little size and experience. Um, but I, I sense there's probably going to be a time where they're going to have a draft pick. They're going to be on the clock and there's going to be a receiver that's going to be so high on their board that they just can't resist them and said, you know, we're, we're going to take them. Uh, I just, he's just too good of it. Like, like last year with Tylon Wallace, they clearly did not want to still be in the receiver market, but they're sitting there. It was late fourth. Right. And they had him off the board in the middle of their board. He was a day three guy comfortably day three, not even end of day three. And they're sitting there like, how do we, you know, we, we, we preach best player available and this guy's still here late in the fourth. So they took him. I sense it could be one of those situations again. I mean, I'm not anti receiver. And I I know I said that already. It's just like, okay, are they just going to add another middle round guy and just bury, you know, does that mean Tylon Wallace is going to get buried or whoever they draft is going to get buried or Prochet is going to be buried. And, and two more years down the line, we don't know if any of these guys are any good because they don't get a chance. Um, you, you know, like that, that would be my thing. I, I think I, I love Brown and Bateman. Um, I, I'd like to see Duvernay and Prochet get more of a chance. I, I really think they need another move tight end. I don't think you can argue that point. Oh, yeah. And it just comes off like how many of these guys are you going to be able to use? How many of these guys are you going to get? You're going to be able to get on the field. Um, you, you know, so, uh, again, I, I could see them drafting one, no doubt. I mean, my, I, if, if that guy's available, that really diversifies the group. I think, you, you know, you, you can take a shot at that. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I worry a little bit though, that the lack of veterans on that group and just the lack of mm-hmm. diversity in general, they really need a, a, a bigger body kind of guy. I mean, maybe you get that in your number two tight end or your number three tight end or whatever, but I think they just could use to diversify the targets a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And um when we watch the uh the videos, um one thing that's uh very encouraging to see uh is that it's Rashad Bateman out there, is that it's uh James Proche out there, and is that it's uh, Benjamin Victor out there too. Um and what that said to me um is that with Lamar Jackson, uh something that could take the offense to another level is just him spreading the ball out a lot more. Uh because we know of course. Hollywood, he's going to get his targets. Every He is going to get his targets. We know Mark Andrews, he's going to get his targets for sure, without a doubt. Um, but now with the other guys, uh, with a Rashad Bateman, with a Proche, um, to, to spread it out more just to make the offense uh, less predictable. Some of that's on Lamar, some of that's on Greg Roman as well when yeah. it comes to play calling. And, and, and like you mentioned earlier, the, the usage of the wide receivers. Um, Because that's that's been a a big topic that we've talked about on here a lot Um, that with the Ravens, that if if a receiver is drafted in the third round or lower, then they're not going to get used. Um, And it's it's very hard for them to make it out alive because we saw like first round Hollywood, he gets used all the time. Rashad Bateman, he got I mean, he was injured a lot and him and Lamar, they were they were kind of injured at different times and whatnot. So that kind of messed it up. But he got used too. But other than that. Uh, Miles Boykin, was, they so so gave him a shot, but uh, Proche, Duvernay, um, Tylen Wallace, he he ended up getting hurt on that special team play on that fake punt, um, but he wasn't really used much either. So that that's one of my big reasons for wanting them to take a receiver early, um, if they're gonna take one at all. I'd say either early or or don't do it at all. I think that makes perfect sense. Yeah, I, I agree. If you know. If you find a legit guy, a difference maker guy that's different than what you have, that that's mm-hmm. where I think you could make a strong uh, case for it. Um, but if you're just going to throw out another third day, day three flyer, and look, I, I they it's not like lately it's the cost of being a GM. You can accuse them of only going after day three flyers. Uh, that's kind of what they used to do with the. Jaleel Scotts and, and, uh, you know, uh, Jordan Lastly's of the world. I mean, nobody's invested more assets in the draft and receiver than the last three years in the Ravens. So, uh, again, um, I'm not accusing them of doing that, but yeah, like a day three flyer to me, um, you know, I guess there's Justin Ross out there now, 
could you say we can give him a red shirt year, the kid from Clemson who's coming off a major injury, and then see what we have. When you have that many fourth and fourth round picks, I think you could probably afford to do that. <laughs> but in terms of any guy drafted on day three as a receiver, unless there's injuries, we're going to question, well, how the heck are they going to use that guy? It, right. You know what I mean? Like you said. So uh, um, if they're, you know, the go big or go home strategy, hey, wh why not? You know, if you find a guy that you really like that you don't have, uh, th that's where it makes sense. Um, but I'd much rather see him, you know, use those day three picks on, you know, adding guys like, you know, an, an extra middle linebacker. I think we'll see them mm -hmm. get a another running back with one of those day three picks. I think we'll see him get a tight end with some of those day three pick, one of those day three picks. That's sort of the happy zone there uh, mm -hmm. where I think they could add quality depth at tight end receiver, right. not at receiver, excuse me, tight end. Um, what was I just talking at tight end running back? And mm -hmm. then maybe you, you can probably get a, a developmental offensive lineman with one of those fourth round picks too, that you feel pretty good about. Oh, yeah. So they'll have a lot of options. And I think really the theme for this year and Eric DaCosta, he's been getting better year after year. Uh, but the theme for this year is just really trying to get the most impactful players you possibly can come away with uh, in this draft. I know they have 10 picks right now. I don't expect them to use all 10 picks. I think they'll move around a bit. But um, I think that should be the theme uh, for this year. Uh, so just get an impact guys. Yeah. And, and, and you know what I, you say move around a little, a little bit. I totally agree. And I've said this before. Uh, I think they'll try to get a 2023 pick at some point during this year's draft. You mm -hmm. know, they go in, I don't know if they have their seventh next year, but I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time assessing with seventh round picks, but <laughs> we're, we know they're not getting any comps as of now. Right. So, yeah, um, and I can't remember the last time the Ravens haven't had an extra pick or two in those middle rounds. Um, now, who knows? You know, like they got a fourth for Ben Bredesen. So there's still opportunities to get draft picks for 2023. But mm -hmm. um, at some point, you know, you get a lot of injured guys back. I, I think we do see their needs. But like, I think you ask yourself. How many, how much room is there, honestly? Like how many, you know, we know there's probably going to be an undrafted guy that makes this team. There is right. just about every year. Mm -hmm. So you draft 12 guys or whatever, 10, 12 guys, and then throw in an undrafted guy. Is there really room on this roster for 13, 14 rookies or whatever it is? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. I think that has to govern your decision making. Get impact players. Um, if you don't feel like there's that great options, uh, with that six rounder or that, excuse me, one of the fourth rounders, and you could get another mid round pick next year in return. I, I think you got to look at it. I know, uh, we're, uh, kind of, uh, you know, we all want to be satisfied immediately. And I know if they make that trade and get a future pick, we're going to hear, well, the, this is a huge year for us. The window's closing. We can't afford to, you know, push stuff off to next year, but, I think it's the right play if you could get a, a good pick next year in your process of moving around the drafts. But obviously that's not the, the number one goal, but I, I would right. think that will be in their back of their mind at some point, uh, probably heading into day three of the draft. Yeah, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. But anyway, Jeff, appreciate you uh, coming through. Appreciate you spending your time uh, with us here on the channel. Thank you for that. Let everybody know where to find you at as far as Twitter, The Athletic, everything. Yeah, I'm at Jeff Zrebeck on Twitter, um, and that at the Athletic, we still I think uh, I think we still have a dollar per month deal, and man, uh, uh, we got a lot of drafts draft stuff planned. Um, I put up kind of a big board today, not with rankings, just looking at particular players in all three rounds. Um, I have a story planned for pretty much uh, you know every day this week. Obviously, I'll have multiple stories when the draft starts coming out, mm -hmm. and they start adding players to the organization. It, it, it's an exciting time. Yeah. Uh, we have a, a mock draft here uh, going on now that'll be up on Wednesday. Honestly, I'm trying to pay a little attention so I don't lap, get lapped here. Uh, I, was, I was honestly looking to trade up for Thibodeau, uh, but he, <laughs> he he went really early, a lot earlier than I thought he was. I just wanted to kind of mm -hmm. do something different. but uh, So that'll be out. But, yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for being patient. I know we oh, talked yeah. about this last week, but I appreciate you uh, hanging with me here. And, uh, again – uh, it'll be fun. Let's let's do this soon after the draft when we start seeing some of these players come in. Oh, yeah, for sure. Appreciate it. So, everybody, make sure you follow. I know most of you are already following Jeff on Twitter anyway, but if you're not, follow him and go subscribe to The Athletic as well. And I'll leave the link to all of that stuff down below in the description. So, appreciate it. Thanks for watching.
Ooyah.